personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about constitutional republic versus pure democracy, how the U.S. election process has changed. Yeah, I mean, the the election process, this is, ti- this is very timely because of this whole, like, desire to get people on mail-in ballots, which, you know, big surprise, um... I am very much against, but, you know, things people don't know is that, first of all, voting didn't take place in private until I think the late 19th century. And so you may, you voted in public. Um, The government didn't print ballots. You usually got them from either the local party functionary or from the newspaper, because of course the newspaper you know, would have basically been you read a Whig paper or a Democrat paper and they would just mail the ballot out and it had the straight it had the straight ticket line on it. That also made ballot stuffing very, very easily, much like mail in ballot balloting um, potentially well, and of course, the obvious one is that, you know, the franchise was for the most part restricted to white male property owners, though that is not as true as people think it is. It is pretty true, but it's not as true as people think it is. And we're going to get into that a bit throughout this podcast. Now, the only qualification for being able to vote is being over the age of 18. And people are going to want to the Democrats want to make it so that people can automatically register when they get a driver's license. And then there's that push for mail-in balloting. I think that it is a bad thing that we have much, much, much more democracy than we did in the past. That does not mean that I'm in favor of stripping um, black people and women of the right to vote. It just means that I think that, you know, there should be greater qualifications than maintaining a pulse for 18 years. So, you know, open the pocket constitutions, people, uh, and see where it says who can vote and who can't. doesn't actually say anywhere, mostly, because the Constitution makes that the right of the state. There are some amendments, of course, that say that the, say that the states cannot bar people from voting on the basis of race, sex, or being over the age of 18. But otherwise, you know, the, the, you know, California could lower the voting age to 12 uh, if they wanted to. There's nothing preventing them from doing that. There's nothing preventing a number of restrictions on the franchise. Uh, of course, there's states where felons can't vote, and there's no constitutional prohibition against that. Prior to the existence of the United States, there were still elections and there were many, many more restrictions in place. Property qualifications were the most common. Plymouth Colony also and others also had religious tests. Plymouth Colony required the voters be orthodox in the fundamentals of religion, uh, which probably meant no Catholics and no Quakers and also probably no Baptists. Um, Rhode Island was in fact founded so that the, the, so that Baptists would be allowed to vote early colonial elections, you know, Catholics, Quakers and Baptists, most frequent group of people to be barred the vote. Jews were forbidden from state office in Maryland until 1828 because of a state law requiring affirmation of a belief in the afterlife, which, you know, not all Jews don't believe in the afterlife, but many Jews do not believe in the afterlife in the sense that Christians mean it. And so they were excluded from state office on those bounds. And uh, the first laws drafted by the United States were a process for 
people to become citizens and able to vote in places where citizenship was a requirement to do so. Citizenship, not a requirement in a lot of states and colonies in the early days of the United States. And natural born citizens, of course, are the only ones who can become president. We don't really know what that means because it's never been litigated out. But we have uh, an article that if it's not up now will be that discusses the history of what the natural born citizen clause means and has meant. Um, I am not, so I don't think that there should be, um, I don't think that there should be religious requirement to hold office or vote, but I do think that it's a gross oversimplification to say that this is just some kind of petty religious bigotry. Uh, colonists and the colonial governments considered it important to only allow people who shared their values to vote. And also there's a notion during this period in history of collective salvation. So you're kind of, you know, responsible for the salvation of your neighbor as much as you are your own. And there's a whole series of laws and codes that make it difficult for people to espouse and practice heterodox religious beliefs around that time. Um, so I, I, I think that it's just not really true that it's this kind of, you know, simplistic bigotry that led to these laws. I think that there's a whole kind of, um, way of looking at the world that we don't really have anymore. It's fly in my truck, get out of here. Um, so yeah, I think from our state of the art recording studio, everyone should know at home. Yeah, right. I'm on my pickup truck in the desert. Uh, the property holding thing I think is also another, um, thing that gets misconstrued. Um, I actually don't think that property holding is a bad requirement for people. Sometimes this was land, but a lot of times like artisans could use their tools as to meet the property threshold in different places. Um, but really what the property thing is, the property thing is, you know, everyone thinks, oh, well, it's so that, you know, the upper crust can decide our elections. It's like, not really, because a lot of times the property requirements were pretty low. Like I said, like a blacksmith with enough tools could, could meet the property threshold in a lot of places. It was mostly about excluding indentured servants uh, indigent people and the merchant class more than anything, because the merchant class historically was viewed w with a sort of suspicion, uh, partly because of the wheeler dealer nature of it, partly because, you know, if you're a farmer or even a blacksmith, as we're using that as our old timey artisan profession example, you know, you can't really just pick up stakes and leave if things get going bad, you can't just sell the land and take off. I mean, you can, but it's a lot, it's pretty difficult if the polity has been completely destroyed through malfeasance and government. So really the property requirement is about, um, skin in the game because it's a lot easier for a merchant to pick up, uh, stakes and go somewhere else to the next colony. Once they've looted, you know, loot, use the franchise to loot the public treasury than it is for a freeholder or an artisan around that time. And so the idea is that this skin in the game will lead to more long-term strategic thinking about how the government should be run. Now, interestingly, um, women were allowed to vote in New Jersey until 1807 because they could meet the property requirement. What changed under Jacksonian democracy that I think is really a, a thing that never really gets talked about is that Jacksonian democracy expanded the franchise, yes, but what it more did was shift the requirement for voting from property to race and, and sex, that these were the requirements now. It was being, a, being white and male, not owning a certain amount of property. Um, free blacks still had the right to vote in some Northern states until 1838. Again, 
if there were property requirements, they had to meet these property requirements, but there was nothing barring um, free blacks from voting in a number of, of, of northern states until 1838. Now, part of the reason why there's this shift towards all white men being able to vote is because they white men disproportionately were the veterans of the War of 1812. Uh, or at the very least were defending their communities from Indian raids. And so it was believed that those who were, that, that this type of service um, it was what entitled you to the, to the franchise. So it's, you know, kind of like a starship troopers thing where, you know, the, the people who are doing the, who are doing the fighting should be making the decisions about what the, what form the government should have. By 1856, all of the property requirements were gone, but there were five states that still had tax requirements. What the tax requirements were is, was very, very difficult to find out anything about, but it mostly was a poll tax, which is where you have to pay you know, whatever fee to vote, um, or you have to prove that you've paid a certain amount of tax to vote. Again, this makes a certain kind of sense because you... Um, you know, the people who are paying the taxes should be the ones who are saying how the tax money should be spent. By 1856, there were only two states that had tax requirements, Rhode Island and Pennsylvania. The tax requirements remained in place in Rhode Island and Pennsylvania until the 20th century. There was a small, low-level civil war in Rhode Island known as the Door War, and you know, when we talk about the disenfranchisement that occurred after the post-Civil War era, we mostly talk about blacks in the South, which I, which by the way, I think is completely appropriate. I think that that was, that is the main story there. But I also think that sort of, you know, story 1B is the disenfranchisement of poor whites because poor whites frequently voted the same way as um, free blacks, i.e. for the Republican Party. We have a really cool story on the website about the Battle of Athens, which is the tale of World War II veterans, mostly but not exclusively white, rising up against an entrenched, corrupt machine in Athens, uh, Tennessee, I want to say. Maybe it's Kentucky, uh, somewhere around there. And they returned from battle and refused to be denied the right to vote anymore. And it actually is a really, really cool story about multi, about a multi-racial, mostly working class movement in America, defeating the powers that be. They came very, very close to forming a new political party that came out of this. And they decided that it was inappropriate to agitate and organize politically on the basis of military service during the Second World War, um, I think that America would be a much different and much better country had they pulled the trigger on that. But Yeah, a fascinating story, really, and one you can appreciate why they don't teach it in public schools. Indeed. Uh, there are 15 constitutional amendments that have been passed since the Civil War. Four of them involve the franchise. 15th Amendment bars states from restricting franchise on the basis of race. The 19th does the same on the basis of sex. The 24th bars any tax requirements. And the 26th bars age restrictions against those over the age of 18. So effectively lowers the voting age to 18. Though, as I said, there's nothing preventing states from lowering it beneath that. Uh, the 17th Amendment allows for the direct election of senators. I think that this is maybe the worst amendment to the Constitution, and I am going to – yeah, I'm going to say I, I like this one less than I like prohibition because uh, I am a teetotaler, as keen listeners of the podcast may know, though I don't honestly don't really care if you drink, but I don't really like – it's hard for me to get worked up over uh, banning alcohol both because I don't use it and because I think that it encourages a lot of – stupid, destructive, and antisocial behavior. Um, but, you know, whatever, the prohibition days are gone. But so the previous method of electing senators was that they were appointed by 
or they're not appointed, they were elected by state legislatures. Again, this was not like some kind of oversight on the part of the founders. It was to give state governments leverage against the federal government because if the state government's control is in the Senate, then the Senate is going to represent the state government's interests, which I think is a good thing. I think that federalism is a good thing. And I do not think that the state governments are like branch management organizations for the federal government. I'm very much in favor of strong state governments and weak federal governments. So this is not just, again, to kind of like ruin your day by making it by not allowing you to have a say in who is the senator from your state. It's to prevent consolidation and centralization of the government. The 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote, right? Wrong. Women had been voting uh, in many states, beginning in Wyoming in 1869. It was particularly, it was much more prevalent in the western states. One way, uh, it was one way to get women to move out west because women were not really about moving out to Wyoming. And so one way to entice women to move to Wyoming was to offer them the vote. One man, one vote is, I'm going to say, pure democracy boiled down into a single phrase. I am against one man, one vote. I am against pure democracy. There are three decisions from the Earl Warren Supreme Court, uh, which reminds me of my one of my favorite moments on King of the Hill, where Peggy says to Hank, did putting a woman on the Supreme Court ruin it? And Hank says, yes. And that woman's name was Earl Warren. <laughs> uh, Baker v. Carr is, an, is a Warren court decision that found that federal courts had jurisdiction over state redistricting efforts. Westbury v. Sanders found that United States representative districts whose borders are determined by state governments have to be roughly equal in population. And Reynolds v. Sims, which is probably my least favorite of these, basically means that state governments aren't allowed to have a Senate. So you may have a you may have a thing called a Senate in your state if you don't live in Nebraska. Um, is there another state that has a unicameral legislature? Anyway, Nebraska does. But what you have is just a House of Representatives with fewer people in it. Uh, there's you know it's not uh, legal to give every county to representatives in the United States populations of state legislatures, both b b both um, state, both state legis every, every state legislature that you have, every house of the state legislature that you have has to have roughly similar districts in terms of population, which like, I don't really, I, that, I don't like that. And I think if states want to have that, that's fine. But I don't think the federal government should mandate that. Now, Sam, is this where gerrymandering rears its head? Is, is that So gerrymandering is like a really good example of how all of this stuff doesn't really work anyway. Because like the state government and the House of Representatives determine what the um, districts look like. And do you think they're like not – creating districts to give their party an advantage of course they are and this has been going on since time immemorial um you look at the shapes of some of these districts you know they're 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 not they they're not they bear no resemblance to the natural kind of ebb and flow of the, the population the population density and the culture of the area and everything to do with just kind of giving an giving an advantage to one or another political party i don't know what the number of state what we might call safe congressional seats are in the united states but i'm guessing it's i'm guessing it's in the hundreds hmm. you know if there's 400 and what 438 uh members of the house of representative 435 i'm i would wager that 200 of those are non-competitive but i don't know so we're all raised to think that democracy is this great thing um, and it, conversely, it's frequently said, particularly by conservatives, that the United States is not a democracy, that it is a constitutional republic. I think yeah. that this, you know, is a verifiable fact. But we started the, hearing that all the time in 2016 when people were whining about Clinton winning the popular or losing the election. It became reflexive. 
And, and as and as Kellyanne Conway said, will someone remind me what you what the prize for winning the popular vote is? <laughs> yeah. What do you get when you win the popular vote for president? You get the same books to Costco. N- you get bragging rights. <laughs> That's it. You get a whole lot of nothing. Um, this is not like. It's not what they were running for. Um, so, and I think that's great because I don't think that the middle of the, I don't think that the interior of the country should be uh, farm serfs for people in 20 counties or whatever it was uh, in, uh, on the coast. So how many counties did Hillary Clinton win is always a really illustrative you look at the map, and it just looks like a series of archipelagos and islands. Hillary Clinton won 487 counties in the United States. Donald Trump won 2,626. I don't care how I don't care how many people live in those counties. Um, 487 counties should not be determining who is the president of the United States. Uh, I think that one of the one of the big, best criticisms of the electoral college is that it forces candidates to pay perhaps more attention to Ohio than Ohio really deserves. I think that that's a fair criticism, but you know I don't think that uh, Nebraska exists to to grow food for the rest of the country and have absolutely no say in federal policy, which is yeah. effectively what those who want to abolish the electoral college and move over to a pure one man, one boat system want. I think that in a country as large and diverse as the United States, both geographically and demographically as the United States is, uh, I think that having some sort of system like this in place is Ideal. If you live in a country the size of Belgium, I don't know that that a system like that would make any sense. But the United States is, you know, depending on how much of uh, what China says is part of China, you think is actually part of China. America is either the third or fourth geographically largest country in the world, and I believe the third or fourth. I believe we're the fourth after China, India, and Brazil. I believe the, the United States is the fourth largest, fourth most populous country in the world. It is the third after China and India. Wait, is that, that can't be right. We do not have, we do not have more people than Brazil. We do, hmm. we huh. do. We have more. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm amazed, but um, I'm shocked. And, and in fact, the fourth isn't even Brazil. It's Indonesia. We're going to spend the rest of the podcast listing all the countries America is bigger than. <laughs> yeah, Starting all the West. Vatican all City, of them except for- bigger than Vatican City, bigger than San Marino, bigger than Liechtenstein. Uh, that's it. That's all I know. Yeah, so I mean, America is large both geographically and in terms of its of its population, and the Electoral College. And the Senate both allow rural states to have a strong voice in how the country is run rather than being ruled over by people in urban centers who don't own guns, can't grow food and have never met their neighbors. Um, I think that like the, the I think that the bigger problem with regard to the Electoral College is not the way that it works, but that um, but that the political parties have uh, become increasingly polarized though more the Democratic Party than the Republican Party, and that there is not really uh, a we, – we, we're, we're, in a, we're, in, we're in a situation where somebody who can make it through a Democratic primary – generally can't win a federal election and somebody who could win a federal election can't make it through a democratic primary. And I think that the primary system is in fact a bigger driver of these problems than the existence of the electoral college. So before the 1970s, primaries actually didn't mean much of anything. You could use them to parlay yourself into a strategic position, um, but 
you know, it wasn't like the end all and be all. And mostly candidates were chosen by party bosses and party functionaries than the average Joe on the street who wanders down to the polling station and manages to vote for whoever. A um, lot of good candidates produced during that time. Whether you think that any of these people are are were good for the country or not is sort of less relevant than whether or not they were eminently qualified for office in the sense of a resume. So you got both Roosevelt's, Coolidge, Wilson, Eisenhower, Kennedy, I'm trying to think, also ran from that period. Uh, before then, you know, you've got uh, Hubert Humphrey, Adlai Stevenson, um, Al Smith, who I think is probably one of the best human beings who lost a presidential election. Thomas Dewey. I mean, you've got a lot of like, even the people who lose are, you could do worse than electing the people who lost that election. So a lot of good candidates thrown up during that time period in terms of having a good um, pedigree for office. What you don't have is a lot of duds. You've got a couple. Barry Goldwater, big dud. Mm. Uh, another dud would be it was Alf it was Alf Landon who ran against Roosevelt in thirty six, but like no one was beating Roosevelt in thirty six. Um, Wendell Wilkie is kind of kind of a dud. Uh, McGovern is the you know McGovern and Goldwater are kind of the gold standard in 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 duds. And then you've got, you know, after the primary era, you've got people like Mondale, Dukakis, and Romney, which are just kind of the dog doesn't like the dog food kind of candidates. But the, what's been lost because of the primary system, which is motivated on getting out the vote rather than party bosses trying to pick somebody who can win, because it's not just like, oh, cool, my candidate won. It's like there's a lot of jobs at stake in this system. Now, I know that there's a civil service system that yada, 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 but like there's also a lot of stuff that comes and goes with the vagaries of the of the electorate and the party bosses do not want to lose access, not necessarily to those jobs, but to the ability to hand them out is almost the, the bigger deal there. It's difficult to talk about like what would have happened if so and so would have been nominated, would they would they not won? Um, but I think that a really good example of a guy who, who the party boss is locked out, who probably would have lost is Senator Bob Taft, who I think is a great historical Senator. Um, he was kind of the Ron Paul of the Senate in the forties and fifties. He was known as Mr. Conservative and he was, he, you know, if there had been a cool James Bond movie called this back then he probably also would have been known as Dr. No because he was very much in favor of rolling back the new deal anytime that he could do it. Uh, but I don't see him beating Adlai Stevenson in 52, but who knows? Um, the party bosses in the last two primaries did lean pretty heavily on the scale to stop Bernie Sanders in each case, but Donald Trump, you know, it didn't really matter what the party bosses did to Donald Trump. He just cruised straight to that nomination in 2016 on the basis of popular support. I think that what we, another thing that we've lost in turn, you know, I don't think it's just like party functionaries and uh, sycophants who lose out because of this. I think that one thing that we've lost is substantive issue driven. Uh, debates and campaigns that address the real problems of Americans. What we now have are is our elections are largely driven by personality and cultural different cultural differences between the parties that mostly are like I would argue less about substantive cultural issues and more about kind of just like cultural preferences like. You know, do you prefer pickup trucks or Priuses? Um, do you prefer Drake or Tim McGraw? 
Um, mm. Do you prefer basketball or football? I think that these are kinds of the petty things that our, our electoral system has been reduced to as we have selected our candidates on the basis of democracy rather than kind of letting people who know what the hell they're doing pick the candidates. We've got some history of electoral fraud in the United States, which is relevant as we move into the 2020 election. There's the election of 1876 that required a congressional electoral commission to figure out 20 outstanding electoral votes. The, um, there was, you know, the Democratic candidate needed one and uh, the Republican candidate needed all 20 and five members from the House and the Senate met with five members of the Supreme Court to figure it out. And, you know, so like Southern Democrats were doing things like printing up ballots with pictures of Abraham Lincoln on them. Which yeah, I saw that. Very sneaky. It's, I, 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 I admire it. I, I really do. I admire, I admire this kind of like chicanery in a, in a certain sense because it's very smart because this is, what percentage of the population is, can actually read the ballot? And what percentage of the population can just see like a picture of, of honest Abe surrounded by American flag bunting. So good, good on them. This is I wonder how well one. that would still work. Oh, um, probably not well because of the internet, because there would be, you know, immediately there would be email chains and, 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 uh, share if you agree type of stuff. Samuel Tilden, who was the Democratic candidate, uh, his supporters claimed that they had 100,000 100, men ready to march on the Capitol and install him as president. This may sound familiar, in, uh, you know, a week after the election in November. There was a party line vote on the Electoral Commission, gave all of the votes to Republican Rutherford B. Hayes, but they got a number of concessions, the most important uh, of which was that they withdrew the remaining federal troops. The House of Representatives passed a non-binding resolution declaring Samuel Tilden the winner, and the Electoral Count Act of 1887 made the state legislature the official arbiter of who counted as an elector, which that was the, the meat of Bush v. Gore, which took place um, you know, over a hundred years later, 1960 election also disputed, not formally and officially, but I forget who said, who, who it was that said they stole it fair and square huh. to Nixon when he was contemplating doing a recount. Eisenhower urged him to do a recount actually, um, as did some other people. But yeah, president Eisenhower said that he should have demanded a recount and a going over, but Richard Nixon, who in addition to being highly intelligent is also like, this is a thing people don't know about him because he's been slandered, uh, and by historians and the press for so long. Uh, Richard Nixon is easily one of the, one of the most morally upstanding human beings to ever hold the office of president. And he refused to do a recount because he thought that it would diminish the prestige of America on the world stage to have a contested election. He thought that it was bad for the country and he did think that he did think that he won. Uh, he thought that if he did a, if he did a recount that it would vindicate him as did, as I said, president Eisenhower, uh, and, uh, Senator Barry Goldwater, who would follow him as the Republican nominee in 1964. Um, there was a special prosecutor who charged 650 people with voter fraud that year, but none of them were convicted. You know, nobody really, nobody knows and nobody will know, but I suspect that he probably won on the basis of, that he being Kennedy probably won on the basis of mob ties in Chicago and Lyndon Johnson's stranglehold on the state of Texas. So I understand that the, uh, 
the televised debates had an impact as well. Just putting Kennedy next to Nixon in the same room swayed voters toward the handsomer guy. There is, you know, there's there's something to that. Yeah. There's there's something to that, and Nixon himself in his memoirs talks about how he thought that you know there was no way he was going to stand next to John F. Kennedy and like yeah. win a debate. Nixon sweating could, with his five o'clock shadow, looking like he was about to lecture you for spray painting the back of the school. Kennedy with his yacht tan and his gorgeous mop of hair. I mean, forget. I about actually it. think that that John F. Kennedy is a goofy howdy doody looking kind of guy i hate this like and i and i think richard nixon is quite a handsome man frankly and i think that this like well, nixon is a nixon is a menacing weirdo and kennedy is this like golden god thing um i consider to be a giant giant myth but i do think that uh nixon was just coming out of surgery um and nixon also like I'm trying to remember the cartoon character who like shaves and his beard immediately grows back. Oh, that was Homer. But, yeah, Nixon has to, Nixon is like had to shave like three times a day yeah. to, to 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 have the five o'clock shadow that he always had. Like Nixon's, if Nixon had let his beard go, that would have been a. I don't know. I don't know that America could have handled that power. Um, but in any, <laughs> the in any event, universe where beard Nixon becomes emperor. Bearded, bearded Emperor Nixon, I'm here for it. <laughs> well, you got funny taste in men, Sam. <laughs> there was the uh, the 2000 election, uh, which most people listening to this probably remember. Uh, you know, it's the one, the first one in our lifetime where we remember that the, um, the popular vote was won by the guy who didn't win the election. This is where the Supreme, the people think that the Supreme Court, that the fix was put in. They stopped the recount under the equal protection clause, and it allowed a vote count certified by Secretary of State Catherine Harris, who is both a uh, member of the Republican Party and a close ally of the Bush family, to stand. And no one, as far as I know, had credibly accused anyone of ballot stuffing or any kind of chicanery in terms of like throwing out boxes of votes or anything like that. But the Democrats didn't, the Democrats wanted a statewide recount and the Republicans wanted a countywide recount and, you know, big surprise, each party wanted the recount that was probably going to let them win Florida. So in any event, now there's this kind of move towards, Andrew Yang, um, who I actually think would have been a really solid candidate for president in a general election. And, you know, so so says me and Barack Obama, um, who say what you will about him. But Barack Obama is a man who knows how to win two elections. Uh, and he was very dismayed that Joe Biden did not select him as his running mate because he thought that he would have been just what the doctor ordered, but, um, there's, he, he and others have advocated lowering the voting age to 16. Um, in Scotland, you're allowed to vote in elections for Scottish parliament and in the Scottish independence referendums from the age of 16 on <laughs> anyone who thinks this is a good idea has not spent much time around a 16 year old lately. I frankly don't know that I think 18 is a good age. For people to be allowed to vote because I think that 18 year olds are pretty stupid. Well, um, there's the Smedley Butler argument that only people who can go fight in wars should be able to vote. Yeah, I mean, I honestly like if I'm being if I'm laying them on the if I'm laying my cards on the table, um, I I would if if I, if I were dictator of the world and I could wave a magic wand, um, it would be military service. That would be the first, last, and only requirement. Would be would be military service, and I am iffy on whether or not uh, we should e even restrict that to like combat troops. Um, I don't think that IQ is. I don't think. I don't think that we should be selecting for intelligence because I think. Well, first of all, high IQ. Uh, there's a lot of overlap with high IQ people and sociopathy. 
uh, and other dark triad characteristics. Um, mm. I've heard, you know, conservatives both in in the media and in banter in gyms and things like that say, well, it sh- they should have a civics test. And it's like, no, because the civics test is going to be written by, you know, God knows who. And it's, yeah. that's just going to be hard not to abuse any test. Yeah, uh, that's like all going to be otherwise. Right, right. So that's going to be, you know, put through the ringer and have political football played with it. Um, I, I, I think that it should just be, I, I really don't think only veterans should be allowed to vote. And I'm not a veteran. Um, and I am, you know, knowing the, the, the handful of veterans that I know, like I am so comfortable giving up the franchise and letting those guys hash it out because, you know, as much as I, as I do love, uh, president Donald Trump, I do think that it kind of says something about our system that we basically have a reality show host and an insult comedian <laughs> as our president, um, as awesome as I think his insult comedy is, uh, I do think that it kind of says something about our system that like, that's, that's who we threw up. Um, I know if we, if we only let veterans vote, then on day one, chewing tobacco would become legal. That much chewing tobacco would become mandatory. Yeah. If you don't have a, (laughs) if you don't have a dip in your lip, you, uh, you get deported. That would be probably veteran prerogative number one yeah so i mean i i think that is like if somebody's got a better system i am all ears on it but i i think that the franchise should be earned and i think that the only reasonable way to earn that is through military service and no other kind of service and and and, you know and i'm i'm iffy on whether or not it should be restricted to people who have been in actual combat positions in the military um but you know like the the democrats will well what about school teachers and you know social workers and all these no military service is the only thing in my opinion that should qualify somebody for the vote there are also proposals to allow the entire to not only to to remove citizenship as a requirement, which it isn't in some municipal elections. Um, and I'm comfortable, you know, like cities can determine who can vote in their elections. That's fine. Um, but some have argued that the entire world should have a say in who becomes the president of the United States because of our power throughout the world. And as you and I discussed off mic before the last podcast we were we recorded um you know this is some insane person writing for the uh independent today yeah but tomorrow it'll be you know a mainstream proposal and i don't really know what the difference between allowing non-citizens to vote and creating 30 million new citizens with the stroke of a pen who are now allowed to vote. I don't really see a a substantive difference between those two things. So I would argue that the Democratic Party is effectively running on allowing people in this country illegally the right to vote. I mean, well, I think your uh, veterans-only voting scheme may be a little extreme. I think you should at least have to pay taxes to determine who gets to decide how your taxes are getting spent. Um, net net taxpayer is another one that I've heard thrown out. Um, I'm, you know, that I think that there's worse ways to determine, like anyone over the like letting anyone over the age of eighteen vote. Um, I think I think it would be an improvement. But um, I really, I really think it should be restricted to um, to the military because I think that that selects for a number of characteristics, such as um, a willingness to sacrifice for the greater good, a long term strategic view of the country. I mean, every 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 veteran that I know, and I don't know a ton, but every veteran that I know, you know, they may not be like the smartest guy on the block in terms of knowing, you know, this, that, or the other about American history or things like that. But you know what they all have in common? They all got a hell of a lot of common sense. Um, And that's just kind of anecdotally something that I have noted about 
veterans. Cause like, I don't think it should be like this technocratic, who's the smartest guy kind of, kind of thing. I think it really is just about skin in the game, a long-term view of what is best for society as a whole, not what's best for my segment of the population for the next 10 minutes, hmm. which is what I think that the pure democracy model selects for. And I also think that, you know, more than intelligence, I think that, that, um, common sense, because intelligent people think that Medicare for all is the greatest thing since sliced bread. People with common sense go, how the hell are you going to pay for it? Hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think that these like wonky, you know, n super like minutia of this or that policy. I think that like, that's what you're going to get when it's quote unquote, smart people deci deciding who our leaders are. Um, when it's just, you know, people with a goodly amount of common sense, I think that you're going to get a government that gives you a goodly amount of common sense. I think that highly intelligent people tend to be um, neurotic and also easily manipulated by verbal gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And I think that people with common sense um, are, are very difficult to manipulate with verbal gymnastics because they just kind of go, that sounds stupid and I'm not listening to your argument anymore because it just on the face of it sounds stupid. Um, and I think that honestly, fr frankly, I think that, um, we need a lot more of like, no, that just sounds dumb in this country. And I don't really feel the need, you know, this is like my, my, my criticism of like, for example, like Ben Shapiro and the facts and logic type conservatives is like, no, actually there's like tons of stuff that we don't need to argue against. We can just go, that's stupid and point and laugh because that's the only response that it, that it merits, you know, like a good, a good example to bring it back to, to what we're talking about is like this, you know, lowering the voting age to 16 or something like, no, it's just stupid. We don't need to have a debate about this. <laughs> It's yeah. just, it's just idiotic on its face and requires absolutely no further thought than that. Um, and I think that, you know, the kind of like educated, too clever by half elites in the media and the non-governmental organizations in this country, you know, I think that part of why they, part of their strength comes from this like idea that every idea merits you know, debate and discussion and careful dissection. And it's like, you know, you can make up an argument to justify absolutely anything mm -hmm. and it can sound really good. But what we need is a lot more. The emperor has no clothes yeah, types well, of things. By saying some ridiculous arguments should be debated. You're putting it on the same level as the sensible right. take on things. It's, it's a great way to introduce nonsense to the public discourse that otherwise never would have gotten any attention at all. Yes, ab ab absolutely. And I think that this is like, I think that also not only are highly intelligent people easily manipulated by verbal gymnastics, but people of sort of, this is one of those like people of high intelligence and people of, of, of relatively low intelligence have something in common. And it's that their, their opinions are sort of easily manipulated Though I also think that there, there's a commonality where there's a lot of people who are smart who are not easily manipulated, and there's a lot of people who aren't very smart who are uh, not not very easily manipulated. Um, but the the ballot so ballot harvesting is the last kind of thing we have to to, to get to on this, um, which is this. For those who don't know, um, this is a practice where you know somebody, probably a Democrat, will drive around and collect ballots for people. Uh, we have examples of. I mean, they had to completely do over a North Carolina election, uh, which was the first time in history that I'm aware where Democrats were worried about voter fraud. But because of, you know, so basically somebody drives around, and picks up ballots. We have examples of people throwing out ballots because they did not have the right, quote unquote, candidate on them. Uh, you don't even have to look at the ballots to like, you know, know who's to throw out. You can if you if you're savvy, you can figure out 
you know, what if you lose 10,000 ballots from this district, that's going to benefit this candidate. It's pretty easy to figure out for somebody who's savvy enough to get into the position of ballot harvesting. Um, Mail-in ballots and ballot harvesting have been pushed by the Democratic Party in the wake of the Chinese coronavirus, which if you're not an 85-year-old diabetic is not a thing that you really have to worry about too much. But they're using this to push you know, these mail-in ballots, which are like, it's not an absentee ballot that you request and that is sent to you. Or um, in my district, you literally, you, you go in and you request an absentee ballot at the county clerk and they just hand you one. Um, this is like, how, how many, how many circulars do you get that are addressed to somebody who hasn't lived in your house for eight years? Oh, I'm still getting mail for a guy named Duck Kim. Yeah. So, like, Duck Kim's ballot is going to get sent to you, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, it's, and then there's all kinds of problems with this, and there's not any real way to verify and track it. Uh, Democrats, of course, hate the idea that somebody should, you know, they want a blood sample from you to be able to buy a gun, but they don't think that you should be able to, you should have to prevent, present identification yeah. to get a, you know, to get into a voting booth. Yeah, right. And, you need ID to buy nail polish remover, but... That's right. Uh, that's rational. So I think that really the worst part of all this is kind of going back to what we talked about before, which is that I believe that pure democracy is much more easily manipulated by ideological kingmakers who are unelected, uh, mostly in the media, also in non-governmental organizations to kind of. Uh, manipulate the the discourse in this country and manipulate policy. I think that the advantage of of the official kingmakers of the party bosses of old is that they, I, in my opinion, were much more beholden to their constituency constituencies in the form of you know jobs, um, handing out these patronage jobs, but also just things like um, you know getting. Twenty thousand dollars worth of God, I don't know, you know, roads built and wherever and things like that. Um, that used to be how you manipulated the vote. You actually had to deliver something. You know, you had to. And granted, there's a lot of graft, and there's you know, you look at like the way that, for example, um, waste management is done in the state of New Jersey. You know, The Sopranos is not a t- terrible representation of kind of how some public works projects get run, particularly in the Northeast. But I am going to say that I think that that system was more equitable and preferable to the one that we have now, where they deliver absolutely nothing to their constituency, but good feelings and a pat on the back. And there's not a lot of, you know, and party bosses had skin in the game in a way that mass media and non-governmental organizations do not. There's no accountability whatsoever in this current system. And so, you know, and I think that that not only impacts the people who are living today, but also our children and the the, the body politic in a more broadly speaking sense in terms of future generations and what our country looks like in in a bigger way than it just looks right now and that is really it in terms this is another long one uh this is really it in terms of pure democracy i think there's a lot of problems with it and i think that there are a number of um alternatives that we could be using and now comes the time where i tell you that you can get twenty dollars off two hundred dollars worth of ammunition or more from ammo.com you can get pretty much you can get calibers you never heard of But don't worry, you can also get the ones that you have heard of and are using on a regular basis. Got a lot of bulk ammo. I know that you want to buy some bulk ammo. And I know that you want to get $20 off your bulk ammo that you buy off of ammo.com. So thanks again for joining us on the Resistance Library podcast. We will see you next time. 